Analyzing a visual communication is pretty straightforward, and this could be anything from a photograph to a billboard to a movie poster. Anything where the primary means of communicating the message has to do with that visual modality. So when you're doing a visual analysis, you pretty much follow the exact same formula as with the textual analysis. You need to understand the rhetorical situation, and you need to understand the specific rhetorical devices that get used in visual analysis. And for this, what we end up having is formal and social layers. In my textual analysis video, I talked about how as you go from textual to visual to multimodal, you just get more elements added on that you have to look at during the analysis. So when you do end up looking at a communication that is primarily visual but has text elements to it, you'll still apply what you know about textual analysis to those text elements. And you will see some examples of that as we go through some examples to highlight what the formal and social layers actually are. In the simplest possible terms, your formal layers are just the technical features of an image. So if you're looking at all seven components of your formal layers for rhetorical analysis, you end up with emphasis, framing, point of view, degree of focus, distance from subject, lighting, contrast, and color. If you're a photographer or visual artist, these are probably words that are familiar to you. But if not, we're just going to go through them. Emphasis. That just refers to what is the point of focus when you look at an image. Typically, it's the first thing that your eyes are attracted to. So if we look at this poster for Ghostbusters, what we're going to see is that the ghost in the background or you can see the three main characters up front. So that's where the emphasis is. Emphasis is what the communicator draws our attention toward. And there's numerous ways to draw emphasis toward something. One of the easiest ways to do that is simply to put that subject in the center of the image, as you see here. Other ways might be through using contrast, through highlighting it in some other way, through the actual framing of the image, which we'll get into all that later. But for now, emphasis is just what is emphasized the most in the image. And then the next thing that we have is the framing, which is just a fancy word for what is included in the image, as well as what might be excluded from the image. So if you look at the framing here for this poster, all that's in the frame are these three Ghostbusters standing on what appears to be a road looking up. There's dark skies above them. That's what's in the frame. So they're framed in the center of the image with the ghost behind them also framed slightly above them. Uh, there's a cutoff at the road. There is text on the screen that is sort of blocking them. So that text above and below them is also working to place emphasis on them since that's blocking them in within that frame. All right, and then next we have point of view. Point of view just refers to where the camera is located in relationship to the subject or the point of emphasis. So for this Dark Knight poster, we can look at this and we can see that the point of view is pretty much straightforward where I line with the subject if we're looking at this poster. And so it doesn't really create any particular effect to be at eye line. However, we might consider how the effect might change if the camera was positioned above the subject looking down or positioned closer to their feet or their knees looking up at them. And we can figure out why a communicator would want to position the camera there by determining what effect is created by that point of view. If I was going to analyze this, I would just say that the point of view doesn't really have any bearing on the image itself. But there is something here that does have a bearing on the image, and that is degree of focus. If you look really carefully, you can see that everything in this image is blurred out. So the character's jacket at the bottom of the frame is blurry. Their shoulders toward the top of the frame and their face, that's all blurred out. So the only parts of this image that are in clear focus are the gloves and the text why so serious, which means that those are probably the parts of the image that we are intended to focus on more, which is why it's called degree of focus. And this is another tool that you can use to figure out what the emphasis is in an image. All right. And now the last things that we have here are the distance from subject, which can be important in an analysis. We can see that here with the Exorcist poster. If we're looking at distance here, we can see from this poster that we are situated across the sidewalk from what appears to be the character who is emphasized. How do you know that this character who is standing in this light is emphasized? For several reasons. And that has to do with the contrast and the color. Looking at the color of this poster, just about everything is black 
or just this really dark blue. It's nighttime. There's not a lot of sources of light out here. So the only color that we get is from the title of the film, The Exorcist, this street lamp, and then this light shining from the window in this house. So everything else is black, but the only thing that's given real emphasis is this character who is standing in the light because there's that contrast between the white and the black that makes his shadow stick out. So contrast too is really important to calling attention to certain elements in an image. Color is also important in the sense of complementary colors or maybe colors that don't go well together. Maybe that creates a particular effect. And then it's also important in terms of the psychology of what certain colors mean. So in this case, The Exorcist, it's about an exorcism, obviously. And so in that context, we can look at this light shining from the window and we can think, what does light represent as an object? What does the color white represent? Purity, right? So there's purity shining out from this window onto this subject. We can make that determination. And the subject is shrouded in this shadow. What does that say about them? Does that mean that they are susceptible to this darkness that is surrounding everything except for this light? Those are the kinds of conclusions you could come to through looking at and analyzing the different elements of this. So that's just a really quick rundown of all those things. Again, you're not always gonna be able to find these things in every image and they aren't always going to be important in every image. So for an analysis, it's always gonna be your job to figure out which of these elements is most important and focus on those. So those seven covers the formal elements, the technical elements of photography. And then moving on from that, we have social layers. Social layers are a little bit more complex. You could think of them as the symbolic features of an image, which will make more sense once I actually describe them and show some examples of it. But the first one is going to be dominant shapes. And I'll, I'll throw in social meanings for this too. So here we have a poster for the movie Lord of War starring Nicolas Cage. And if we're thinking about dominant shapes, we're thinking about what shapes are recurring in an image and what might that mean? So if we're looking at dominant shapes here, we could consider cylinders or maybe even triangles a dominant shape since that's sort of the shape of a cartridge. It's, it's very angular like a triangle. Uh, what does that mean? That's the next question you want to answer. A triangle is sharp, much like um, a bullet is able to pierce someone. A triangle is an object that has sharp edges that can pierce. And maybe you could draw that connection there. If you have an image that has a lot of rounded edges to it, that might give it a softer feel than something that has more squared off edges. That might make it feel more mechanical or more artificial, and that might imbue a certain sense into whatever image you're looking at. So those dominant shapes are going to be important in that sense. And then you also have social meanings, which is essentially just taking an object and ascribing a meaning to it based on your social understanding of it. So for this, we have a man who is standing here in a suit and a suit carries with it a specific social meaning. There's a sense of formality to it, a sense of professionalism that we can attribute to this character or this movie based on the fact that they're wearing a suit. There's also the fact that his entire face and body is made up of these cartridges. Weapons, violence, death, war. I mean, the movie is called Lord of War, right? And this is where also looking at text, even if you are looking at a visual communication, comes in handy. Because you can use the title of this film, Lord of War, to make an assumption about, not even an assumption, but draw a conclusion, really, about what these casings are meant to represent. So if we didn't have the title on this poster, we could still take these cartridges and look at them to represent war. But that's kind of where we would be making an assumption about what is being conveyed here, more so than we would be if we know and we see that the title is Lord of War, so we can use that. But just to refresh, dominant shapes, recurring shapes that appear within a visual communication and drawing meaning from those shapes, or trying to figure out how the use of those shapes changes your understanding of a piece of visual communication. And then social meanings, just taking different objects within the image and ascribing whatever socially we believe those things to represent, ascribing those properties to it and using that as a way to interpret the image.
All right, and the last two things we have are really just one, and I just split them up, but it's a narrative. And so your narrative, it comprises two things. You have your actor and you have your action. So in this example from the Barbarian poster, our narrative actor is the woman who is standing in the doorway. That's the only actor that we have here. And in this case, we're looking at a still image, but there is still an action happening because this still image captures one moment that is squeezed between many moments before and after it. So you really just take what you see in this still image and you extrapolate based on what you see, what was happening before and what was happening after. So here, if we look at this, we can see that on her face, this person looks a little bit distressed, a little bit confused, a little bit apprehensive. So you might say that the narrative action for this is that a woman discovers a hidden basement and is apprehensive about going down to see what's in there. The details that you choose to include in that about how this actor feels as she is engaging in this action or where she came from, you reach those conclusions based on clues that you see in the image. So whether that is her body language, uh, her face, her facial expression, uh, the way she's dressed or anything else, the use of color, these can all be things that inform your understanding of the narrative action. So for this, we can put a few more elements together to really figure this out. We have two primary colors here, red and black. Those are both colors that are prominent in horror films, which this is, so that makes sense. Red being a color that symbolizes blood. Uh, black being a color that symbolizes darkness and mystery. So both of those things can also be used to figure out what the narrative action is. We can also consider the framing, how we are straight ahead, and it almost feels like the actor is looking directly at us if we're staring straight on into this poster and maybe you can draw some conclusion based on that. Uh, you see her shadow um, down on the stairs, which means that there is a light, which we can also see the light shining from behind her. So she is moving from a position of light potentially, wh where she's in the kitchen there, or whatever room that is, into a position of darkness after she crosses through this threshold to go into this basement. We can use all of these understandings of visual rhetoric to reach these conclusions and then make a determination about how we feel about the image, what the image is trying to say, what feeling is it trying to evoke in us as an audience. If you see this image and you're someone who likes horror films, is this something that speaks to you? And what parts of this speak to you? Because that's the objective of making a post like this, is to appeal to someone who would be interested in watching the film. Yeah, but that's as quick a rundown as I can give you for the different layers of rhetoric. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to understand all of those things using those posters as examples. Um, obviously, like I said earlier, if it's not a poster, if it's just a photograph or it's a different kind of visual medium, you might have to approach it a little bit differently in trying to figure out how everything is connected. As for the analysis itself, it functions pretty much exactly like a textual analysis. Identify the rhetorical situation, identify the rhetorical devices, and just explain how those devices are either successful or unsuccessful in conveying their message or accomplishing their purpose, or explaining what impacts those different devices are having on how that image is to be perceived and what message is to be gained out of it. So instead of a movie poster, let's take a look at photography for a more in-depth look at visual analysis. We're going to use this as an example. Now you probably have no idea who took this picture, when or where it was taken, or any of the other context surrounding it, but the visual rhetoric alone can tell you quite a bit about it. So immediately we have a narrative actor, the boy in the orange shirt, who also serves as the emphasis of the image. The framing cuts off the leg of a man who's standing nearby, and he would be another actor in terms of rhetoric, and we can infer some social meanings through the comparison of these two actors. One is bent over and the other is standing straight up. Therefore, one is in a position of servitude and the other in a position of leadership. Those are the social meanings that we can derive from those positions that they're in. And then Thinking about the narrative action, we can probably infer that the supervisor is overlooking the completion of uh, some cleanup operation at a dump 
and we can ascertain that this is a dump based on we we can see the debris in the frame right there so we could probably assume that that's a dump and then moving right along our our point of view here is below the point of emphasis so we're lower than eye line of our primary actor so this creates this really stark contrast between him and those that smog uh, that smoke that's right overhead if this image were taken at eye line with him then we wouldn't have that contrast between him and the smoke but we're fairly close to the point of emphasis in terms of distance and that close distance combined with that point of view really helps to to bring out this this sense of unity between all of these elements so between that smoke and then between our actor and between the debris on the ground all of that feels very homogenous because of this very close distance between them and that might be something that speaks to the message of this piece and moving right along, most everything here is pretty well in focus. The only thing that's really out of focus is the city in the background, but it's also very far away, so it's hard to tell if it's just out of focus or just too far to be seen clearly. But we do see that just peeking out between the, the smoke and the ground there. As far as color, the only real colors that stand out are the browns and the oranges. I mean, most everything else here is, is either black or white or just really desaturated. And like I was saying earlier with how the actor gains this contrast against those clouds, there's also contrast created here with the colors because these, these browns and oranges are the only colors that you can really see here. And having those against this primarily black and white backdrop allows those to stick out more which means that our photographer here is probably trying to draw attention to that color, or at least wants you to think about that color in relation to the message uh, they want to get across. Now, if you can run through your entire list of rhetorical devices for visual, your social and your formal layers, and you can like, pick out that many things just at a glance at an image, then you should find that doing the actual analysis comes maybe a little bit easier than doing a textual analysis, even if it might require you to do a little bit more research than you might for a text analysis. Okay, so I already have all this laid out, so I'm not gonna spend that much time on it, but I do wanna point one small thing out, message, children are exploited in waste management industry that I had to research, exigence, emergence of electrical waste trade in Ghana, and exploitation, had to look that up. Circulation museum exhibits, had to Google that one. Modality visual is obvious. Genre photojournalism, I just decided that on myself because that's what it seems like it is. Citational context, I had to Google this. Single photograph within a larger collection, remember citational context refers to uh, whether or not this communication is in good company, so to speak. And it's, in this case, surrounded by other photographs from the same set. Geographical context, this was research. Accra, Ghana is where these photographs were taken and that is the uh, capital of Ghana. Historical context, 2008, the advent of the electrical waste recycling industry, not necessarily trade, but I guess trade and recycling, had to look that up. Sociocultural context, I couldn't really think of anything or find anything for that, so um, I probably won't use that in my analysis. I don't know how useful it would be. It probably would be pretty useful, but if I can't find anything concrete, then I'll just leave that where it is. But my main point here is that for my rhetorical situation, I had to do some digging to find some of this information. And some of this is important information. Message, exigence, uh, the citational context, geographical context, historical context, that's all really important information. So just because you can't find the rhetorical situation just from looking at a document doesn't mean you just stop there and just go with what you have. Always take that next step and try to research to fill in some of those blanks. And if you can't fill in all the blanks, then it's fine. Typically, I tell my students it's okay to just say there is no information about who the uh, communicator is for this or who the author is, who the painter is for whatever this is. There's no available information for when this was communicated. If that's what the case is, that's fine. Again, don't feel like you have to have everything, but at least do your due diligence and try to research what you can. 
So generally when I am putting together notes for a visual analysis, I am just going to go through the same as with a textual analysis. I'm just going to go through and I'm going to list all of my different layers. I'm going to make as many notes I can about what's happening with each of those rhetorical devices. So you can see that I have all of that there. I have highlighted parts that I feel are going to be really interesting where I can make some really profound points about the visuals. But ultimately, I'm just taking notes. You know, some of these things are things that I said earlier in the video. So you can see some of those things also appearing in my notes just from my first impressions of that document. So you can create a lot of your notes from that first impression just going through really quickly before giving it another pass and maybe adding some more detailed notes. Again, these notes are not as comprehensive as I might do them otherwise, but they're there. Same thing for social layers. I have all four of my social layers listed out. They didn't find any dominant shapes, so I'm not gonna include that. Uh, some notes on the narrative action, the narrative actors, and the social meanings of objects and shapes. And again, am I necessarily gonna use all this information? No, but I've organized all my information. I know what I can talk about. And now I can look back at all of these notes and I can figure out a way to structure all of these in a way that makes sense for my analysis. And that leads us down to the outline, which I have broken down into five paragraphs. That does make it a five paragraph essay, but that does not mean that your paragraph has to be five, page, five paragraphs. Let it be as long or as short as it needs to. However many paragraphs you need to get your point across for your analysis, use that many paragraphs. So for this basic introduction, I'm going to present the background, talk about socioeconomic context, maybe if I can, but mostly just touch on the rhetorical situation, overview of the significant rhetorical devices. And then first body paragraph is gonna be about the composition. So I'm gonna be looking at the emphasis, framing, things like that. Body paragraph two is gonna be about the narrative, what's going on, what does that say? How effective is it? And then body paragraph three is gonna be about color. And I'll tell you this, I'm doing color last because I think that color is the most important part. I think that the color and that sense of, of bleakness and the contrast that's created there, but that's gonna be what really propels what I talk about in terms of composition and narrative to the next level, which is why I'm doing that last. So again, when you're doing a rhetorical analysis, you're also um, engaging in the act of rhetorical creation. So make sure that as you're outlining and as you're thinking about how you present your ideas, you're doing it in a way that, that makes sense and that makes your ideas stand out more as much as they possibly can. So here's my draft. This is going to be available. Links in the description for you to look at. But what I really want to focus on with this is taking a look at the highlighted sections, especially in this introduction because you don't have to just list out elements of the rhetorical situation. These can be embedded into your sentence structure. I, my introduction is always just a, state, a relevant statement of fact. Many parts of the world are bereft of the degree of social and political coverage that first world countries take for granted. And that's my opening sentence because I wanna transition that into the idea of the speaker here using his photography to bring attention to this, bring attention uh, to other countries who might want to intervene and might want to help if there are any issues in Ghana, uh, to document the plight of the young workforce who work tirelessly, that's the purpose. Identify that it's a photograph, uh, depicts a young boy engaged in, in salvage, so in my introduction paragraph, I'm already mentioning what the narrative is here. So I have that element there as well. This is a plea that would be seen across art exhibits. There's my circulation. And then my final question here is, which begs the question, um, is this work rhetorically effective? Right. So that's what I'm trying to figure out because Ghana remains a hotbed for the industry of waste recycling. So how effective was this message if that's still the case? That's what I'm trying to decipher here. Looking forward, aforementioned young boy, central figure in the frame, front and center. So by saying that he's the central figure in the frame, that's the emphasis, he's front and center, his position within the framing. So I have that. He takes up the majority of the photograph center, bent over to pick up or examine a piece of waste. This right here, that's also narrative action. This serves to redirect the audience's gaze both above and below the boy 
at either of the two remaining primary subjects of the composition. So that's part of my analysis. So remember, you do want to move back and forth between identification and analysis. I mentioned that the point of view is close to the ground, and this projects the boy as a figure caught in the smoke above. So that's the effect that's created. Right? I could probably speak more about that and say why that effect is important. Present the boy this way. He unifies the boy with the smoke a smog likely resulting from the burning of pungent plastic waste. So there's more analysis there. Symbolically, the smoke of burning plastic consumes the boy. Right. So I have all of that for my analysis. Uh, the surface, which bleeds into the lens of the camera, and by that I mean that the ground as it's photographed is littered with debris and larger waste. A union between the ground and sky and the boy's unique position bridging them establishes the relationship between the workers and the environment. This probably sounds a little bit pretentious, like um, I'm really flexing cre creatively in order to make this make sense. The author isn't going to pop up and tell you, the speaker isn't going to pop up and say, yeah, this is exactly what I meant to accomplish by making these choices. They can't come up and tell you that, which means that it's completely up to you to figure out what it is that they were trying to convey uh, through their rhetorical choices. And like I said in the previous video, as long as you're able to make a sensible argument as to why you believe some part of the composition represents something abstract, then that's fine. So when you're analyzing a visual or even a multimodal document, don't get too caught up with trying to display or trying to explain what you think the speaker intended. Because to some extent, their intent doesn't really matter if I tell you something and you misinterpret it and you get a completely different message out of it, then maybe I just wasn't clear. Maybe that's my fault. So uh, don't feel like you need to uh, appease what you think the speaker was trying to say. What does their message say to you as the person who's taking in that message? That's what you want to express and find a way to express that that still makes sense, that's still centered around what you understand about rhetoric and you should be able to write a pretty unique analysis for any visual text. So don't get, don't get too caught up in trying to be correct about it because there really isn't a correct. There's only what is justifiable. So you can justify uh, what you are analyzing and how you're expressing it and explaining it, then that's fine. Go in that direction. Be creative with it. This example will be available for you to look at and review. Do remember that it is just a draft. It is a complete skeleton of an analysis. Use it as reference. Use it with this video to kind of see what's going on there. But don't take it as a perfect example of a visual analysis, please. But that's about all I got. Stay healthy, drink water, cook, and think about them. Tell your friends that you love them, and I will see you next time.